Welcome to r slash pro revenge where OP gets $300,000 revenge. Our next reddit post is from Lime Cherry. I've dealt with my sucky, manipulative, abusive aunt all my life and I finally got revenge. For everyone involved in this story, I'm a male in my late 30s and my sister is 3 years younger. My aunt is my mom's older sister and I have 3 cousins, 1 male and 2 female. I have good relationships with them now, mostly. My estranged father who had been living several counties over is pretty much out of the picture by the time my parents got their divorce when I was 9. Due to financial hardship, we were forced to live with my aunt and the nightmare of a household we would soon find ourselves in. My aunt married into Georgia wealth and you can figure out what that means on your own. She had three kids and eventually caught her husband having an affair. It's a huge scandal. She gets the house, the kids, and a fat payout from the family attorney. This is important because my aunt didn't do a single thing in her life to earn her money, her house, her lifestyle, or basically anything. She was born poor along with my mom. Under her household, she was drunk with power. Years of therapy have allowed me to recognize that certain people, when in a position of power, get a perverse pleasure in ordering others to do their bidding. She was the strictest of authoritarians in every possible way you could imagine. Chores had to be completed by an exact specific time. Vacuuming by 3.45 p.m., dishes by 3.55 p.m., laundry days for my mother were Tuesday to Thursday, 5.35 to 7.55. If it was still running, she would shut the power off for the two units. As we grew older, her own kids opted to stay with their father for full-time custody and she had them on the weekends. Even they couldn't stand her when she was in charge of the house. As time passed, she got them less and less, opting for alternating weekends as high school activities took precedence over time with mother. For my sister and I, the large six-bedroom house was not ours for the taking. My mom had to pay rent, as well as rent for one bedroom, as that was all she could afford on her salary. We had to share a bedroom until my second year of high school. All the while, there was one spare unused bedroom available at all times. My aunt needed this for guests when they stayed over. Not one guest stayed there in the 10 years I was under that roof. Finally, the church we attended told my aunt to give up the spare bedroom so my sister could have her own room as it was unhealthy for two teenagers sharing a room together like that. This infuriated my aunt because someone told her what to do in her own household. My sister and I got the brunt of her wrath. As my mom's salary was tapped out, my sister and I had to do extra chores like mowing the lawn, trimming the shrubs, and cleaning the pool, which we could no longer use without her being outside watching us. My aunt's behavior was becoming more and more outrageous and disconnected from society. For example, she had always snapped her fingers when she wanted to get someone's attention, but it was getting far more frequent and she would blow up into a tirade if either my sister and I didn't obey. Her own kids tried repeatedly to tell her that what she was doing was wrong, but she wouldn't listen. Eventually, they wanted nothing to do with her outside of the home. She was a tyrant there and repeated intervention to get her to see the folly of her ways would fall on deaf ears. All through high school, I had no confidence as a person. I was weak-willed and growing ever distant from friends and society. I say this in all truthfulness and fear that had circumstances continued the way they'd been going, I could very well have taken a gun to myself or worse, to others around me. I was that bad off. I had just graduated high school and started my first semester of community college. I am two weeks into my classes attending from home when my aunt drops a bomb on me. You owe me money for this month's rent. The same amount for next month's rent as well. It's the 27th after all. You're an adult now. You're out of high school and working now, so you need to pay rent. The F? I blew an effing gasket as I yelled back. You can't just suddenly decide to charge me rent just because you feel like it. I need 30 days notice. I have rights. My aunt yelled some BS excuse that she had discussed this with my mother and it was decided that I needed to pay my own rent now. In some miraculous backbone move, of which I still have no idea how I stood up to her, I yelled right back at her. If I'm an adult, then treat me like one and talk to me about rental agreements. I'll start paying you rent in 30 days, starting the first. I turned my back to her and walked away with my fist ball tight. I was furious with anger, but I walked away. My aunt saw my fist from behind and screamed bloody murder that I was going to attack her. No, I wasn't. 
She snapped her fingers at me repeatedly to get my attention, but I didn't turn around. I needed to cool off and clear my head. As I turned the corner, she grabbed my wrist hard, yelling, I'm not finished talking with you. I threw my still balled up fist forward, keeping with my stride to break her grip as I hadn't stopped my momentum. This caused her grabbing arm to slam hard into the corner of the wall that I had just turned into. She screamed in pain, but I left the house and took off. The aftermath of that incident was that my aunt called the cops on me in an attempt to press charges. She was taken to the hospital and suffered a fractured wrist and she was put in a cast. Her story changed every time she told the cops what happened, while my story was spot on every time. I can still recall that moment, down to the smell in the house, where I was facing, the working and non-working light bulbs, etc. Forever ingrained in me. I was kicked out of the house and couldn't visit my sister or my mom there at the house again. Fine by me, I didn't want to see my beyond ever again. I was happy to meet my mother and sister at the local diner or outlet. We could be ourselves there and not hostages in our own home. Years later, my mom wised up and got out of that abusive relationship with her sister and moved out on her own. She got a temporary nice place, invested wisely, and with the help of the church, got help getting a place of her own. In 2009, after the housing crisis, she bought her own place that she could have never afforded on her own prior to the market crash. But some good came out of it. She wept knowing my sister and myself can come visit any time and stay. Over the years, I've been able to forgive my aunt. Not forget, forgive. I've let go of a lot of my anger and hatred towards her because of what she put me through. When she has no leverage or control over us, she's a somewhat decent person despite being a total B. My cousins have calmed down, heard my side of what happened those years ago, and know what kind of person I am compared to what kind of person their mother is. They chose to believe me and know that I didn't hit her or strike her or beat her across the face like she continues to claim. The revenge. While I was able to forgive my aunt for what she did to me, I can't forgive her for what she did to my mother. She kept her in financial hardship for a decade while she sat on a bank account full of cash and assets. Or what she did to my sister. She forced her to pay for damages because the water heater burst while my aunt and mother was away one weekend, leaving my sister at home. She didn't discover the flooded room for hours. My aunt's reasoning was that it was her responsibility to watch the house. Not the responsibility of the homeowner to maintain and replace the water heater before it goes. Let's leave that $5,000 financial burden before the flood insurance kicks in on a 16-year-old girl. I had little to no contact with my aunt since I was kicked out of the house nearly two decades ago, but I do keep in contact with my cousins. While I'm not going to divulge what I do for a living, I can say that I work with and for the government. I've worked my butt off getting to where I am today. I'm known for being truthful, wise, and giving good advice when asked. Because of this, I often talk financially with my cousins, all of whom are money smart and are doing well for themselves. They often then relay this information to their scheming mother who has no mind for business and investments. All that money she got from her house sale, her divorce settlement, her previous investments is pretty much gone. I spent years planning on the perfect trap and it took a long time to prepare everything to make sure everything appeared right. I'm not a lawyer and I don't pretend to know the law but I do know the regulations and laws pertaining to insider information. This is not that. I'm 100% certain of it and if I ever go to court, I know my lawyer has a solid case in my defense. But this is a gray area, most definitely. I let slip to my cousins about some future real estate plans near my aunt's new area of living. It may be worth a lot more because of future developments taking place in the area. All of that was true and backed up by what was in the newspaper and the new construction signs that newly appeared on Google Maps at the time. The rest was fabricated by myself, backed up by actual information I looked up on real estate websites and on projects I was working on through my work. The telephone game takes place and a few weeks later, I presume, my aunt starts making phone calls to real estate agents trying to buy lots of land in the undeveloped sucky area of our new house. Over the course of a few months to half a year, she spends $300,000 of her last remaining savings on land hoping it'll pay out when the area around it gets developed in the upcoming years. Only, the local government doesn't have any plans to develop in those immediate areas. In fact, analysis showed that building in those areas was poor planning and would cost the taxpayers twice to three times as much as the land was not environmentally sound. It was better to build six miles away. 
This post was long overdue because it's been over two years since my aunt purchased land that's basically worthless. See, she won't sell the land unless she gets at least the same price she paid for it because she's the owner of that land. You can't tell her what to do on her own land. Sweet karma strikes in a way that I couldn't possibly have foreseen. My cousin informed me that the value of the land has decreased significantly because it's not environmentally sound to build anything commercial there. But it's zoned for commercial use. Currently, three of the four blocks of land she purchased are just weed farms next to an eyesore abandoned building or industrial complex. Nobody can build on it, nor does anyone want to buy it. Sucks to be her. Best part is, my cousins have absolutely no idea that I set them up for their mother to take the fall. These environmental results are relatively new, and the perfect cover to say why the project changed location six miles away. Wow, OP, I'm a little torn on this one. On the one hand, your aunt definitely had it coming to her, but on the other hand, it sounds like you kinda screwed your cousins out of an inheritance, so that kinda sucks. Our next Reddit post is from Jay Stark. When my grandpa was growing up, he didn't have electricity, this being rural Kansas. What they did have was a wood-burning stove. At one point, firewood that my great-grandfather had been storing began to disappear. A thief was afoot. My great-grandfather was getting tired of the firewood disappearing, so he hatches a plan. My great-grandfather takes some of the logs and drills them out leaving a cavity. He then puts some gunpowder in the cavities and plugs the holes to hide his handiwork. That night, he tells my grandpa that he would bring in the firewood. Of course, he knows what logs he's messed with. Now, this is the funny part, and I wish I knew how embellished it was, but stranger things have happened. The next day, my great-grandfather is walking into town and comes across a gentleman also headed into town, and they get to talking. It turns out, the gentleman is going to town to make a purchase. The item he seeks? A new stove. He says to my great-grandfather, I don't know what they're putting in the coal these days, but it destroyed my stove. No wood ever went missing again. Down in the comments, people are sharing that this type of revenge was actually fairly common. Eat More Artichokes explains, I heard explosive lumps of coal were used for sabotage during World War II, and I think during the Civil War too. They were easier to hide since coal dust gets everywhere. It was a really effective way to destroy a locomotive. Hollowed out firewood would be trickier to do, I imagine. And apparently, this was suspected in the explosion of the Sultana during the Civil War. It was the greatest U.S. maritime disaster in history. So apparently in like the early 1900s, it was common for Americans to solve their problems with high explosives and gunpowder pranks. Our next Reddit post is from Calio Page. My best friend Karen is a first grade teacher, and as soon as she told me this story, it gave me such a justice boner that I knew I had to retell it here. Two years ago, Karen had a student named Xavier. A sweet little six-year-old boy when things were good, but his parents had just gotten divorced. His mom wasn't that great even before she was out of the picture, and his dad was quite disengaged from both his son's behavior and his individualized education plan. Rather understandably, Xavier acted out in class. He'd refuse to listen to Karen, push other kids, and disrupt class in more ways than I could possibly list. Now, Karen worked her butt off with Xavier to improve his behavior and get his dad more involved in a positive way. She'd often call me and talk about it to decompress because that's what friends are for. But occasionally, Xavier went too far and did something she couldn't just deal with in class. Like trying to stab another student in the hand with a pencil. On those occasions, she wrote him up with a referral and sent him to the vice principal. But surprise, surprise, vice principal was absolutely no help whatsoever. He'd joke around with Xavier, refuse to address the problem Karen sent Xavier there for, give him candy, and then lecture Karen for writing up a six-year-old for any reason because it reflected badly on the vice principal. I'm pretty sure this has to do with BS known as merit pay, but whatever. Unfortunately, his actions made it significantly harder for Karen to help Xavier. To top it all off, Karen figured out after a few referrals that the vice principal logged into the system and erased each of Xavier's referrals, thus erasing all evidence of Xavier's pattern of behavior. In a word, this is bad. I know nothing about education, but I know that much. My brother was a holy terror in elementary school and got in so much trouble from 3rd to 6th grades that both the principal and the vice principal were on a first name basis with my mom. 
Those records sure didn't just disappear. Not into the shredder, and certainly not into the digital ether. She reported this to her higher-ups who weren't the vice principal, but they both told the vice principal about the complaint and specified that Karen was the one making the complaint. The vice principal was cold and rude to her after that. Nothing was done about it because it seemed to be a one-time thing, but now Karen knew what to do. Every time she had to write Xavier up again, which blessedly became less often as the year went on, she meticulously documented everything herself. She sent herself all the relevant stuff, saved the emails, the whole shebang. By the end of the year, Xavier's behavior had greatly improved thanks to her mentoring and the various ways she learned how to engage with him in the classroom. She even talked to a second grade teacher to make sure the woman knew how to work with Xavier. God, Karen went above and beyond for this child. Partway through the next school year, the higher-ups come talk to Karen again. Even though nothing was done about her complaint the previous year, a record had been made of it. As it turns out, another teacher had reported the vice principal for doing the exact same thing to her as he'd done to Karen. If she had anything related to her own ordeal, they wanted to see it. Oh boy, did she. She gave them every single digital receipt she'd accumulated for the better part of a school year to compare with the vice principals, establishing a pattern of him undermining teachers via erasing students' patterns of behavior. The vice principal was quickly removed from his position as vice principal of Karen's school, even though he wasn't technically fired. He was just moved to a different school and put in a much lower position, and paid significantly less than before. Bonus, he taught history at Karen and Mai's high school while he attended it, and everyone loved him. I look forward to telling this whole story at our reunion because we sure don't like him now. So basically, Karen picked a fight with her manager and won. And on a more serious note, I'm a little bit confused by this story. I mean, I'm not doubting it or anything, I just don't understand what motivation the vice principal would have to hide that behavior. OP mentioned merit pay, but to be honest, I don't really know what that is. Do vice principals get paid more if teachers don't report bad behavior of their kids? That doesn't make any sense. If anyone knows how the system works, please tell me down in the comments because I'm really curious. That was r slash pro revenge, and just a reminder, I have a podcast where I publish the exact same content. You can find my podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. And if you like this content, then hit that subscribe button because I put out new Reddit videos every single day.